17, where Israel had committed so many sins that the Lord had told them, you know, if you just keep the Sabbath day, I won't send you out of captivity, showing the importance of the Lord's Sabbath day. So it's definitely a blessing to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath day with the true word of God, not anything that I've concocted or came up with, but truly the word of God coming out of the law of the prophets and approved of by the apostles. Alright, so what we're going to do today is we have a, we have a lesson today where we're going to deal with the Word of God, we're going to deal with the Lord's Sabbath day. The title of the lesson is called The Lord's Sabbath Day, Labor Therefore to Enter Into. Because the Sabbath day is not just a day where we just come together and we rest and read the Word of God and that's it. You know, it's a lot of people that come into the Word that don't have true understanding on the Lord's Sabbath day. You know, like for instance, you have a lot of, you know, these brothers that's waking up. You know, they come into the Word of God and they feel like the Sabbath day is just a day that... You know, we come together, rest on this day, study the Word of God, and that's it. But when you really get more and more into the understanding the Word of God and the Scriptures, you understand that the Sabbath day points to something more than just a weekly Sabbath. This Sabbath day points to the coming of the Lord and Him setting up His kingdom on this earth for 1,000 years. And we're going to find out as we go through the lesson that a thousand years to the Lord is considered one day. So in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth, uh, when he created mankind, the fish of the sea, and different things of that sort, these all, all of these things took place in one day, which is to the Lord 1,000 years. It didn't just happen in one literal week, like we go from Sunday all the way to Saturday. It didn't happen like that. It happened from uh, the first day, which is 1,000 years, and so on and so forth, to the seventh day. Now. Mankind has sinned against the Lord. He kicked us out of the garden. Now he's given us six days to do what it is we're going to do and get ourselves together so we can receive, receive salvation. And on the seventh day when Christ gets back, then that's when he's going to set his Sabbath day, his day of rest up on this earth. So we're going to get into the word of God today. And we're going to look at this thing so we get understanding on what this, what this Sabbath day is really pointing to. You know, because most of the world today, they're not observing the Sabbath day. You know, as you go around, you'll see people at the gas stations, you'll see people riding around, you know, motorcycle clubs all out on the street and everything, just having a blast on the day that the Lord blessed and sanctified. But tomorrow you're going to have mostly everything shut down. And the world going to be observing the first day of the week, but we're going to also look into that and find out where you get the first day of the week from as it, you know, compares to being... As it compares to the seventh day being the day of the Lord, also compared to the first day being the day of mankind. That's what they set up and that's what they put to the side and that's what they observe. So we're going to look into the scripture. Uh, we're going to find out what the day of the Lord is. And then we're also going to look into some history books and find out what man has given you, how they took the word of God off of the table and they came up with their own traditions. So what we're going to do is we're going to open this up in Genesis chapter 1. And look at this plan as it came into effect. We're not going to deal with the light when the Lord created light and stuff like that. We're just going to look at a couple of scriptures so we can get to the meat of this lesson because, you know, we're dealing with a Sabbath day and it's pretty lengthy. So we're going to try to keep it under two hours. All right? I mean, around two hours. So you can put the time on for me. So we're going to pick this up at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 20. When you get to go ahead and read. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature 
that have life, uh -huh. and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Go ahead. And God created great whales, uh -huh. and every living creature that moved, which the waters brought forth abundantly. All right, skip down to verse 23. Give me a pen, man. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So now we're dealing with the evening and the morning were the fifth day. All right? So what we know is a day to the Lord is the evening and the morning. In order for you to determine what an evening is, uh, the darkness is what determines that. When the day come in, then the light is what brings in day. Okay, but what light is used to determine day? We know that as the sun, okay? All right, go ahead and read. Skip down to verse, uh, your 23, keep reading. 24. Uh-huh. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature out of his kind. Uh-huh. Cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth out of his kind. Go ahead. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth out of his kind, and cattle out of their kind. Uh-huh. And everything that creep upon the earth out of his kind. Go ahead. And God saw that it was good. Mm-hmm. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea Go ahead. and over the fowl of the air mm -hmm. and over the cattle and over all the earth and over and over every creeping thing that creep upon the earth okay hold on one second you put the time on go? yes i can't see you. Okay. Okay. okay all right all right go ahead bro sorry go ahead bro 27. Mm -hmm. So God created man in his own image, Go ahead. and the image of God created he him. Uh -huh. Male and female created he them. Go ahead. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. All right, skip back to verse 29. Oh, uh, yeah, 29. Go ahead. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, mm -hmm. which is upon the face of all the earth. Go ahead. And every tree in, in, in every tree and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. Uh -huh. To you it shall be for me, mm -hmm. and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creep upon the earth. Wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. And it was so. Go ahead. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Uh -huh. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay, so now we got at this time, when the Lord created the beast, all right, the cattle and different things like that, every creeping thing got his kind. And also man, he created, male and female created, he then win on the sixth day. All right, so now we're going to go right into Genesis chapter 2 and pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, mm -hmm. and all the hosts of them. Go ahead. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. Go ahead. And he rested on the seventh day uh -huh. from all his work which he had made. Go ahead. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. All right, so let me just put something on the board right quick. I'm going to put these numbers up here. So what we just read, right, we got seven days from the beginning since the Lord created light all the way down to when the Lord rested was seven days, correct? That's yes. what we just read. So on the seventh day he sanctified this day because that and then he rested from all his work which God created and made. Alright, so it took him seven days. So now, we also see that he sanctified this day. In other words, the first day of the week can be sanctified and blessed by the Lord. I don't care what you try to do. I don't care how you try to change around uh, God's laws and all that type of stuff. It's only one day that he blessed and sanctified, which is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. All right, so now let's go over to Exodus chapter 30 because when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Lord had told them about this Sabbath day. But he gave them a time frame on how long they're supposed to observe this Sabbath day. And we need to look and see, is this something that we can just, you know, observe, observe as long as we want to. And when we get tired of it, then we can go back to Sunday worship. Is that racing? Well, I guess I'll darken with this. So Exodus uh, 31, what does it say on the paper, Brother DeMarcus? What, what verse? Verse 12. All right, so pick it up at verse 12 and go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses, uh -huh. saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel. So who talking? The Lord. The Lord is talking. Is Moses talking? Huh? No, sir. All right, so from what we just saw, we saw that the Lord is speaking to Moses. Okay, go ahead and read. Saying, 
Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. Alright, so right out the gate, we see that it said, Verily my Sabbath. We see an S on that, letting us know that this word Sabbath is a plural. Alright, it's more than one Sabbath. Alright, that's why I said, My Sabbath ye shall keep. Alright, go ahead. For it is a sign between me and you uh -huh. throughout your generation. Go ahead. That ye may know that I am the Lord that do sanctify. All right, so if you keeping the Lord's feast day, because that's what that's what's included in the Sabbath. Uh, you know, we had a, a, a time trying to figure out how to say this, but anyway, Sabbath, Sabbath with an S. If you're keeping those, these are the feast days of the Lord. So the Scripture says, "What? Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generation." So if you're keeping the Lord's feast days. This is how you know that the Lord has, you know, enlightened you or given you understanding on the word of God. It's a sign. All right, so if you see the world, they're not keeping the Lord's feast days. Why? Because they don't have the sign that the Lord has put on them, you know what I'm saying, to be known. Like, for instance, in Revelations, you know, Satan going to put a mark on his people. But the Lord going to seal his people in the forehead. So just like today, when you're keeping the Lord's Sabbath day and the feast day, He putting a sign on you. In other words, He's sealing you also. Go ahead and read verse 14. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, uh -huh. for it is holy unto you. So it's holy unto you. So this is how you reverence this day. This is the holy day. We saw that He blessed and sanctified this day. That word sanctified is to set apart or declare holy. All right, go ahead and read, brother. Everyone that defileth shall surely be put to death. That's right. So this sounds like something that's real important. He said, everyone that defile this Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. All right, so we saw when we first came here, we was dealing with what? The Sabbaths, right? Mm -hmm. It was more than one. But now we're talking about a particular one now. That's why it says in verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore. Notice it's not an S on that. So now we're going into... The law finna break down this Sabbath that's important. Not to say that all of them ain't important, but this one right here, you definitely gotta keep it. This is the first one on the list. Go ahead and read. For whosoever do any work therein, uh -huh. that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Okay, so you can't do no servile work on the, you know, the, the other Sabbath. So what Sabbath are we talking about? The Lord don't let you know. Verse 15, what does it say? Six days may work be done. So now we know we talking about what? The weekly Sabbath. This is the one that you're gonna be cut off from, uh, cut off from if you defile it. Okay, so it says six days may work be done, but what? In the seventh day is the Sabbath of the rest. Uh huh. Holy to the Lord. So in the beginning, when the Lord set aside this day and sanctified it, this day has been holy to the Lord ever since. So now you get ready to come into the covenant with Israel, and what does He do? He lay out to them this Sabbath day. All right, so he says, uh, the seventh day, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. What else? Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath, uh -huh. his soul shall be put to death. Now read that again, brother. I'm sorry. He shall surely be put to death. He said, he, you sound like you read out NIV. He said, he shall surely be put to death. Verse 16, go ahead. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath uh -huh. to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation. So you're going to observe the Sabbath, Sabbath throughout your generation. When you have a child, you're going to raise this child up to keep the Lord's Sabbath day. That child is going to raise their children up to keep the Lord's Sabbath day throughout their generations. Go ahead and read. For a perpetual covenant. That perpetual covenant means forever. It don't mean that I, Christ gonna come in the flesh, down the cross of your sin, then he gonna nail the Sabbath day to the cross. That ain't what it means. It says forever. So can't no man change what the Lord has already put down and etched in stone himself. Go ahead. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel. That's right. So we saw that the Sabbaths was a, a, a sign between the children of Israel, but then he even go into the weekly Sabbath and let you know that that's a sign also. Between him and the children of Israel and everybody that come up under the commonwealth of Israel. That's it on that, brother? No. Go ahead. Forever. For uh -huh. six days the Lord made heaven and earth, uh -huh. and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's right. Now let's go over that to the chapter 20. Because the Ten Commandments, brothers and sisters, is, is the covenant that we are under right now. When you 
come into the baptism, you come into that covenant and you make an agreement that you're going to what? Keep those commandments. These are the royal commandments that stand above all. Even though you have the judgments, the statutes and things that we have to observe, okay, but you still got to keep these commandments. So how is it that you say you love the Lord, but you can't keep one of the commandments that, the matter of fact, the first commandment that came after the Lord told you how to serve him as a God. And we're going to look at what he said. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, what does it say? Remember the Sabbath day. So why is he telling you to remember? Every day there's going to come a time when people are going to try to do away with it. But the Lord is telling you to remember the Sabbath day. Don't let nobody take you away from keeping the Lord's Sabbath day, brothers and sisters. Don't let nobody tell you that they can, you can serve the Lord any day. You can rest every day. That don't make sense. Because when you're resting on the Sabbath day, there's no buying going on, no selling, no cooking going on. So imagine if you did that for seven days straight. Then how would you eat? How would you survive? That don't make sense. The Lord set aside a certain day, which is the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath of the, of the Lord for us to observe. This is the day that he considered holy. And now we're looking into the commandments. These are the Ten Commandments that we're looking at. And we're looking at the, the, uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth commandment here. Verse 8, read it from the top. Go ahead. Remember the Sabbath day uh -huh. to keep it holy. Go ahead. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. Uh -huh. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It ain't the Sabbath of the Jews. Sabbath of the Lord. Thy it's God. the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It ain't the Sabbath of the Sunday Christian. It ain't the Sabbath of the Israelites. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Who did the Lord create? He created all mankind. So all mankind should be what? Observing the Lord's Sabbath day. Go ahead and read, brother. In it, uh -huh. thou shalt do, <clears throat> thou shalt not do any work. Go ahead. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, uh -huh. nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. That's right. Go ahead. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, uh -huh. the sea, and all that in them is. Go ahead. And rested the seventh day. Uh -huh. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed. So notice what we keep reading. We keep reading that what? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, right? But if you read verse 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. So everywhere we done went, we're looking at the seventh day as the Lord already taking his rest. But we're going to look a little further to see has the Lord actually taking his rest yet. Now, let's go over to 1 John chapter 2 because what we just read was a part of those commandments. Like, you can't keep, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, you know what I'm saying, to throw away the Sabbath day. You break one, you break them all. So you got to keep the Lord's Sabbath day. But the world don't want to deal with that. How is it that you can look on your calendar and on your calendar you see what? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You see seven days and the first day start on Saturday. I mean Sunday, excuse me. But the world had you believe that. But you see the first day start with Sunday. If you count from Sunday all the way to Saturday, when you get to Saturday, what? You got the seventh day of the week. That's the Lord's Sabbath day. That's the commandment that we, to what, to observe this throughout our generations as a what, perpetual covenant. So this is a part of the commandment. So let's go to 1 John 2, and when you get to pick it up at verse 1. 1 John 2 and verse 1. Go ahead and read. My little children, uh -huh. these things write I unto you. Go ahead. That ye... <clears throat> that ye sin not. Uh -huh. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So that word sin is what? Transgression of the law. So we look at the scriptures telling you that I write unto you that you what? That you sin not. In other words, don't break the law, brothers and sisters. You got to keep this law. Go ahead. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Uh -huh. And he is the propitiation for our sins. That's right. So in other words, in order for you to be forgiven for your sins, or in order, in order for you to have a shot at salvation, you got to come through Jesus. That's what it means. He's a propitiation for our sin. Go ahead and read. And not for ours only, uh -huh. but also for the sins of the whole world. Some of the world? Whole world. Okay, so... <laughs> I, anyway, I ain't going to go there. But he the propitiation 
for the sins of the whole world. In other words, everybody got a shot at receiving salvation. Just like in 1 Corinthians tell you that death came on every man, even so, the resurrection can come on everybody. Or you being saved from death can come on you also if you do what it is you're supposed to do according to the Bible. Go ahead and read. Verse 3. Uh -huh. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So we know him if we do it. If we keep his commandments, correct? Mm -hmm. Then we just read one of his commandments? Mm -hmm. Remember the Sabbath day. Go ahead and read. He that saith, I know him, uh -huh. and keep not his commandments, is a liar, mm -hmm. and the truth is not in him. That's right. So you can't just go around loving your brothers and sisters, you know, not killing, not stealing, not committing adultery, not you know, not backbiting the covenant in your neighbor's house, but at the same time, you throwing away the Sabbath day. The scriptures say, he that said that I know him and keep not his, his commandments is what? A liar. And the truth, the truth meaning ain't no understanding in him. So if you see them not keeping the Sabbath day, why? Why are they not keeping it? Because they don't understand the plan of salvation. They don't have a sign, they don't have a token between them and God. But the ones who do, we keep the Sabbath day. Verse 5, go ahead. But whoso keep his word, uh -huh. in him verily is the love of God perfect. That's right. Hereby know we that we are in him. That's right. So how do we know that we're in him? Because we're keeping his commandments. This is how you walk in the word of God. This is how you uh, please the Lord by keeping his commandments. Verse 6, go ahead. He that said he abided in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. That's right. So now we're talking about Jesus, brothers and sisters. This is who John is talking about. But we got to go see how he walked. Because if you say you love him, if you say you, you know, you worthy of receiving salvation, then the scripture let you know you got to walk as he walked. So let's go look and see how he walked when he was here in the flesh. Turn over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, because you got a lot of hypocr uh, hypocrites that's going around. A lot of people say they love the Lord. A lot of people say, I know the Lord. You know, I talked with the Lord. He told me this and told me that. The Lord ain't telling you nothing. Those are emotions that are inside, that are inside your head that's convincing you to do certain things. The Bible tells you the prayers of a sinner falls on deaf, ear, uh, deaf ears. A sinner is someone that transgressed the law. So how can the Lord hear you? He may rain on the just as well as the unjust, but don't come around me talking about you have some type of relationship with the Lord and you're not keeping his command. You know, that, that just kind of, you know, kind of throws mud on everybody that are really keeping the commandments. How is it that we keeping the commandments, trying to please the Lord, and here it is, the world ain't keeping their co no, uh, no commandments, but yet still they talk to the Lord. So everybody got a connection with the Lord, whether you keep the commandments or not. That don't make sense. That don't make a bit of sense. And that's what the world will have you believe. But let's go see one of the ways that he walked. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. Go ahead and read, brother. When the devil had ended all the temptations, he departed from him for a season. Uh -huh, so he departed for a season, meaning he's going to come, he will he'll come back. That's how, that's how Satan do y'all, or do us, I'm sorry. That's how Satan do you. He know that you have an area that you're struggling in. You know, you may pass that test, but, you know, Satan is what? Walking to and fro on the earth, seeking whom he may devour. So he'll come back and try to get you in another area. That's why you got to stay rooted in the word of God. Because until you get your immortal body, brothers and sisters, you still are in a fight. And the Bible lets you know that we have our fight with what? In high places. Spirituality, uh, spiritual uh, beings in high places that we can't see. But we know they're there. And how is that war taking place inside that mind? All right, go ahead and read, brother. 14. Uh-huh. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And this is after Jesus got baptized and went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights came out and Satan tempted him. But the Lord didn't fall for it. So now, after he finished being tempted by Satan, now he's finna go to Galilee. Now he's under the Spirit. That's for that when you get baptized. That understanding start opening up. Because you done came into that covenant now. Go ahead and read. And there went out a fame of him throughout uh -huh. all the region round about. Go ahead. And he taught in their synagogues, 
being glorified of all. Uh -huh. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Uh -huh. And as and as his custom was, as his custom was, what did he do? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. So as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. So skip down to verse 22 and go ahead. And all bear and all bear him witness. Uh -huh. And wondered at the grace, the, the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Uh -huh. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Go ahead. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me, This pro this proverb position. Heal thyself. Go ahead. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here thy country. Uh -huh. Go ahead. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Mm -hmm. But I will, but I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, uh -huh. when the heaven was opened up. Three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. Go ahead. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto what's that? Sarpet. What's that? Sarpet. 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 Oh, oh, right there. Sarpet. Sarpeta. Sarpeta. Uh huh. A city of a Sidon unto a woman that was a widow. Uh huh. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha. Mm hmm. The prophet, and none of them was was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian, the Syrian, the Syrian. The Syri. uh -huh. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Mm -hmm. Rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him into the brow of the hill wherein their city was built, uh -huh. that they might cast him down headlong. All right, so they know Jesus. They saying, in, in this the son of Joseph. So now he done came back preaching that to get baptized. He's preaching in the synagogues now. All right, so he hit him with something that took place in the Old Testament between the lives where a family came on the left for three and a half years. And then the lepers and stuff like that. Ain't nobody get healed but one person. So this kind of made them upset. So they thrust him out of the city. So as he goes into the next city, let's see what takes place. Go ahead and read. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. Uh-huh, so he got away from them. Go ahead. And came down to Capernaum, uh -huh. a city of Galilee. And did what? And taught them on the, on the Sabbath day. So I just wanted y'all to see that this is his pattern. That was his custom. So we just saw that what? He that said he abided in him all to even walk as he walked, right? So he walked what? He kept the Sabbath day, right? So that's why we keeping the Sabbath day. If you call yourself a Christian, then you what? You Christ like. You do what Christ did. All right, let's go a little further. Uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Because you know Jesus, he was on a mission. He had to go around and teach the gospel, brothers and sisters. So now, you know, this is a, a situation that took place. Now they're trying to get at him and catch him up. The Pharisees trying to catch him up because during this time, his disciples was hungry. They did something that we're going to read about. But we're going to see how the Lord is going to deal with it. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 1. When you get it, go ahead. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day uh -huh. with the corn. Go ahead. And his disciples were on were in hunger uh -huh. and began to pluck the ears of corn. Go ahead. And to eat. Uh -huh. So they're hungry now. Now remember, they disciples. They going around spreading the gospel. All right. Go ahead. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, uh -huh. Behold, thy disciples do what which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath. Okay. So they tripping now. These brothers hungry now, teaching the gospel. That's like us going out of town. You know, we got to go spread the gospel. But at some point, if you filling up the vehicle, and I got to ride over a thousand miles, you know, some cars on the hold of what? Hold up the 300, uh, that'll take you 300 something miles. You can put 20 something gallons in my vehicle, it's probably going to take me 300, 400 something miles. So if I'm riding over a thousand miles, I'm going to have to stop and do what? Get gas, right? Because right. I'm going to preach the gospel. So that's what's going on here. These brothers preaching the gospel. And they was hungry on this day. So the Pharisees trying to catch Jesus up. Let's see what he said. Go ahead and read verse 3. But he said unto them, uh -huh. Have ye not read what David did uh -huh. when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? Uh -huh. How he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, uh -huh. which was not lawful for him to eat. That's right, go ahead. Neither for them which were with him, mm -hmm. but only for the priests. Well, they was hungry, so they went in there and they ate the, the show bread because, you know, the priests had certain things that was left for them. 
after they, you know, uh, did the sacrifices toward God and stuff like that, there were certain things that was left for them. But David was hungry. So he went in and he ate the showbread. The Lord telling them that. It was okay for them at that time. Because he was hungry. Just like the disciples going through their hunger also. Go ahead and read. Or have you not read uh -huh. the law? Go ahead. How that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profaned the Sabbath. Uh -huh. And are blamed. Right, so some things are allowed. Especially like the priests. If they've got certain duties they got to do inside the temple on the Sabbath day, that's why he says what? Uh... Have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple did what? Profane the Sabbath. That means they defiled the Sabbath. But what did the scripture say? What did he say right, right after that? He said, and are blameless because it was allowed for them to do that. That's just like on the Sabbath day for us, the high Sabbath days. We're supposed to be resting on the high Sabbath days, right? But what can we do on that day? We can cook. Right? Yeah. We can cook for the feast. That's allowed. Go ahead and read. Verse 5. I mean verse 6. But I say unto you uh -huh. that in this place is one greater than the temple. That's right. Who is this in this place that's one greater than the temple? That's Jesus himself. Go ahead, brother. But if but if ye had known what this meaneth, uh -huh. I would have mercy. That's right. I would have mercy. In other words, you guys wouldn't be setting me up to die. He telling them what's going to happen. I would have mercy. I would have mercy. Y'all wouldn't, wouldn't be, you know, coming in the near future to crucify me, he said, I would have mercy and what else? And not sacrifice. And not sacrifice. I wouldn't have to die for y'all if y'all understood who I am. Go ahead and read. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Uh-huh. Well, and that's what they did to Jesus. That's why he was what? He was found with no guile in his mouth. But he had to take on the sins of mankind. That's why I say you would have not condemned the guiltless. Because he hadn't did nothing wrong. We know we ain't talking about regular men because we guiltless out the gate. But Jesus was guiltless. He didn't, I mean, we are, we're not guiltless. We all have, you know, sin. Just us coming in this flesh and blood alone. But Jesus had to come down from the throne and take on the sins of mankind. There wasn't no sin in him. That's why I say you would not have condemned the guiltless. Go ahead and read. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath day. So y'all sitting up here trying to throw stumbling blocks and get at me. But I'm the one who gave you this Sabbath day. I'm the one who told Moses to tell the children of Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm the one that's going to come back on this earth and set up my kingdom for a thousand years, which is going to be my day of rest. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath day. So now let's go over to John chapter 28. John chapter 28, because we got to look at some of the customs of a disciple. Get off his foot, mate. Tell me what you're doing. Go around the other way. All right, John chapter uh, eight. You alright, brother? <laughs> you got some big feet. You say excuse me. He can't hear you. You look at him. You step on the feet. Excuse me. All right, John chapter eight, verse twenty-eight. When you get it, go ahead and read, brother. Then said Jesus unto them, Uh huh. When you have lifted up the Son of Man. Then shall ye know that I am he. Go ahead. And, and that I do nothing of myself. Uh -huh. But as my father have taught me, I speak these things. That's right. Go ahead. And he, and he that sent me is with me. Uh -huh. The father have not left me alone. Uh -huh. For I do always those things that please him. Go ahead. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Uh -huh. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So in order for you to be his disciples, you got to do what? Continue in his word. He said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Go ahead and read verse 32. And ye shall know the truth. And you're going to know the truth. You gonna, your understanding is going to be opened up if you continue in my word. That's why the Father and Him going to come and sup with you. How they going to sup? In the mind. If you continue in His Word. That's why if you notice over time, once you come into the Word of God, and you start keeping the commandments, what happens? The Lord start opening up that understanding, slowly but surely. The next thing you know, it start growing. Understanding start coming more and more and more. But the Scriptures say you should know the truth. That truth is what? The Word of God. You're going to know the truth, and the truth going to do what? And the truth shall make you free. But what are we talking about? Are we talking about a physical free? 
being free physically? No, we talking about being free spiritually, being free from death, brothers and sisters. That's how we're going to be made free. So people use the scripture out of context, not understanding what the Lord is saying here. You're going to know the truth, and the truth is going to make you free. You ain't going to have to worry about the second death, the legal fight. All right, but right before that, we saw that it says, if you continue in my word, then, you are, then are you my disciples indeed. Let's go look at some of the actions of one of the disciples. Let's turn it over to Acts chapter 17. But see, not just were the apostles the disciples. The Lord the one that uh, called them apostles, but they were his disciples that he chose. And he called them apostles. But let's look at one of the actions of the disciples. We're going to go to Acts chapter 17. After Paul was released from prison, he went into another city to preach. And let's see what, what happened. Acts chapter 17. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. You get it. Go ahead and read it. Now when they had passed through Amphiopolis and Apollonia, uh -huh. they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Uh -huh. And Paul, as his manner was... So another word for manner is also custom. So everybody loved Paul, don't they? Everybody would go to Paul and tell you we're not under law, we're under grace. They'll go to Acts... They go to uh, Romans, Ephesians, Corinthians. They scholars in the writings of Paul, so they think they are. But somehow or another, they miss this right here. Verse 2, what does it say, brother? And Paul, as his manner was, uh -huh. went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scripture. So he went in unto them and reasoned with them three Sabbath days out of the scripture. Why did he do that? Because he is a disciple. Someone that follows the Lord. So if you the Lord's disciple, you're going to do the same exact thing. You're going to keep the Sabbath day. Turn over to Acts 13. I ain't got this in the lesson, but I meant to put it in there. But let's go look at it a little bit. We're going to pick it up at Acts uh, 13 and verse 42. Because this one, you know, Paul and Barnabas went to preach the gospel. And also at this time, the Jews got upset because Paul was preaching to them regarding circumcision, you know, telling them, you know, we ain't put that burden on them yet because they got the law of Moses preached to them every Sabbath. You know, over time, once they get converted, they'll realize they got to get circumcised. But, you know, that's not the point of me coming here. The point of me coming here is to show you what the Gentiles said to them after they had got the word. Acts 13 and verse 42, what does it say, brother? When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, uh -huh. the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They asked them to come back the next Sabbath. Now they weren't talking about come back, you know, when the next moon come up. And then once the moon turned black, I mean, or whatever, when the, when the new moon come in, we got to wait one day after the new moon, then we're going to count seven days, then we go going to the Sabbath. They said come back the next Sabbath. Because everybody knew that the Sabbath day is what? The seventh day of the week. That's why in the, uh, I think it's John, when Mary came to the sepulchre, it tell you in the scripture as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. She spoke to the angel. The angel told her he is not here. He is risen. But it tell you in another place, it says that he was gone before the Sabbath day ended. So we know we're talking about a seven day time here. We're not talking about a new moon that we count seven days. We're talking about a weekly Sabbath just like we're dealing with today. That's why we observe it. So skip down the verse. Now read all the way through uh, 44 and go ahead. Now when the congregation was broken up, uh -huh. many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. Uh -huh, they followed Paul and Barnabas. Go ahead. Who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Uh -huh. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together okay, to so, hear the word of God. All right, so this is almost like three weeks in a row. So it says, and then we saw another place he did it again when he went down to Thessalonica. All right, so it says, and the next Sabbath day came almost, what, the whole city together to hear the word of God. That's a custom. That's what they did. That's what the disciples did. And if we are his disciples, we do the same exact thing. 
If you call yourself a Christian, you follow Christ, you do what? You keep the Sabbath day. The same exact thing. All right, so now let's go look at, uh, I got a couple history books I want to look at because the Lord has always had a Sabbath day on the table, brothers and sisters, but mankind in his, in his own mind, he has came up a way, you know, to craft, uh, come up with crafty ways, you know, to get out of serving the Lord correctly. And this is what's going to get a lot of people in the world cut off. All right, so what, the first book we're going to look at is called Satan's Angels Exposed. And you're just going to come over here and read this. Uh, Nate, you're going to, you got your uh, paper? So you can look at what you need to read. You want to highlight the paper? You highlight the uh, paper? Right, come on here. All right, you're going to go to page 55 and 56. But well, you have your paper, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You need to read loud. Read the title and then read all the highlights. Let's see where this sun worship came from or, or, or Sunday. Go ahead. Worship of the sun. Read a lot. Worship of the sun began in Egypt. Uh huh. On Wednesday, May 3rd, 1978, the United States paid homage to the sun. It was called Sunday. They paid homage to the sun. Now that word sun is spelled S-U-N. It was called Sunday. Go ahead. It was President Carter flew to Colorado to deliver a speech to the Solar Energy Research, Research Institute. There were sunrise services and solar displays by both industry and the U.S. Army. Y'all see that sunrise service and solar display. The president had to get on the plane to fly out to Colorado to observe this day. Go ahead. About 12,000 people attended the speech making at the Washington Monument. Uh -huh. The entire United States population had its attention focused on the sun. Why? Uh, how do you spell it? S-U-N. On the sun. S-U-N. Go ahead. It sounds like today, right? The whole entire population got their mind focused on the sun. Go ahead. Why? Because the nat because national leaders believe the sun offers man's last hope of survival in a day of depleting energy. Now, the scripture says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But man has said that the sun is the one that's going to save mankind. Go ahead. The sun is man's last hope for life on this earth. Many turn to the sun in awe to worship. The worship of the sun is not new. Over 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians worshipped the sun, while the Babylonians called the sun Utu. Right, so all this is going back to Babylon, brothers and sisters. That's where all this stuff comes from. It goes all the way back to Babylon. Alright, this is not nothing new. They think it is, but this all was a part of the Lord telling us not to worship these other gods. That's why he told you in Exodus chapter 20 what we're supposed to do as far as worshiping him. He said you should have no other God before him. And that's what we're dealing with today. That's why tomorrow they're going to have all these places filled up in these Sunday churches worshiping what? The sun God. Go ahead. The Egyptians called it Ra or Re. Uh -huh. The center of worship was at Helio Heliopolis. Uh -huh. Pharaohs were known as the son of the sun. Now Pharaohs or kings of Egypt were known as the son, S-O-N, of the sun, S-U-N. Go ahead and read. Sun worship in Egypt gradually spread to the solar cult of Rome. Mm -hmm. it was, oh, it did what? It, it spread gradually. to the solar cult of Rome. So who's in power today? Rome. Who gave you uh, Christmas? Rome. Who gave you Easter? Rome. Sunday worship? Rome. Where they get it from? Babylon. Go ahead. In the third century AD, the emperor Helio Gabalus created the cult called Sol Invictus, mm -hmm. the unconquered sun. Uh huh. And that's what they giving the homage to <laughs> the unconquered sun. Go ahead. And in 274 AD, the emperor Aurelian built a large temple in Rome to Sol Invictus. Mm -hmm. Now. Go ahead. Let me skip down. Skip down to the highlight part. Uh -huh. Not only did the Egyptians worship the sun, they also worshiped the moon. The bull, the crocodile, the hawk, the cow, the baboon, the goat, and many other animals. Mm. The goat and bull were especially sacred to the Egyptians 
as representing sexual creative powers. Y'all see that? The goat and the bull. That's why you look, if you ever look at the Baphomet, you see that goat and it has, uh, it, it got breasts on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But it's a male, it's a male goat, but it has female breasts. It, you know, it's, it, I guess they call it, the, I can't remember the name, the name of it. What you call it? Hermaphrodite, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what, read that last part again. What that what what that goat is still, uh what that what is that, what is that significant of? The goat and bull were especially sacred to the Egyptians. They're especially sacred to the Egyptians, uh huh. As representing sexual creative powers. Okay, alright, now what else you got on page uh, 61, right? 61. Alright, go ahead and read that. The Druids celebrated a number of feast days. Mm -hmm. At dawn on the 25th day of December. Oh uh, when? The 25th day of December. At dawn on the 25th day of December. What's on the 25th day of December, Tori? December 25th. Um, the Druids celebrated a number of feast days. Mm -hmm. At dawn on the 25th day of December. Mm -hmm. What's on the 25th day of December, Tori? December 25th. You don't know? Mm -hmm. Good. What's, <laughs> what's on the 25th day of December? Christmas. Christmas. All right, go ahead. So at dawn on December 25th, what took place? The, the birth of the sun god. The birth of the sun god. Mm -hmm. How do you spell that? S-U-N. S-U-N. The sun god. So this is what you're observing on the day of December 25th. Has nothing to do with Jesus, brothers and sisters. So when people tell you, you know, we getting Christmas presents for the birth of Christ, you ain't getting Christmas presents for the birth of Christ. That's a lie. If you was, it would be inside these scriptures. The Lord is very practical. Everything he wanted you to observe, he set it inside this book. Go ahead and read it. The birth of the sun god was celebrated. Uh -huh. The Druids had a Madonna, or virgin mother, with a child in her arms, and their sun god was resurrected at the time of the year. Their sun god was what? Resurrected. So this is why you got presents. Represent the resurrection of this sun god. And then when you get a little further, you realize that sun god was, they was actually worshiping the resurrection of Tammuz. Go ahead and read. Their sun god was resurrected at the time of the year corresponding to that at which we celebrate Easter. Oh, wow. Okay. That's it on that? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, who's next? Uh, I got a cold holidays or God's holy days. Page 83. I highlight it and go to page 320. You got your paper? All right. Okay, you're good. All right, good job. That's smart. Page 83, highlight it. Let's go look a little further. We got one more book after this, and then we're gonna get back to the scriptures. The worship of Adonis. You're gonna lie, because you got people listening online, and you're also being recorded. So the worship of Adonis was practiced by the Semitic peoples of Babylon, Assyria, and the Greeks borrowed it from them as early as the seventh century before Christ. The true name of the deity was Tammuz, and the religious literature of Babylonia. Tammuz appears as a useful also lover of Ishtar, the great mother of goddess, the embodiment, embodiment. embodiment of the reproductive energies of Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. Every year Tammuz was believed to die. So every year Tammuz was believed to die. And what else? Passing away. Passing away, uh-huh. From the cheerful earth to the gloomy subterranean world. Uh-huh. And every year his divine mistress journey in her quest for him, mm -hmm. that the two might return together to the upper world, and that with their return all nature might receive, revive. Alright, so they would die, and then they revive. Remember I told you that sun worship is, you know, when they celebrate that during Christmas, they really celebrate, you know, the unconquering sun, in other words, it can't die. But they're really talking about Tammuz, okay, and we're going to look at Tammuz in the Bible. Alright, highlight there, what did I say? Orthodox Christian. Christ, Christodom. Christodom practices a similar ceremony in the spring of the year at Easter time. Okay, in the spring of the year at Easter time, they practice a similar ceremony. Similar ceremony at what? This ceremony. Tammuz being risen from the dead. And let's see what that similar ceremony is. Go ahead. This ceremony begins on Good Friday. It begins on Good Friday. That sounds kind of familiar now, right? Go ahead. Evening with mourning for the crucified Jesus as was done for Tammuz. Uh-huh, so all they did was brought what was done over Babylon. They brought it over to the, 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 under the Gentile dynasty, and they just put the name of Christ on it. That's all they did. So it says this ceremony begins on Good Friday evening with mourning for the crucified Jesus, as was done for Tammuz. And what else? 
and it's continued through Saturday night. Uh -huh. In some predominantly Roman Catholic countries, women beat themselves with whips and wet and we? in an attempt to enter into the physical sufferings of Jesus. Okay, so some women beat themselves in Rome, okay, in an attempt to enter into the physical sufferings of Jesus. Go ahead. At the stroke of midnight, uh -huh. beginning Easter Sunday. At the stroke of midnight, beginning Easter Sunday, what happens? The morning gets turned to joy with shouts. Uh huh. What do they say? He is risen. He is risen. So every time you drive around the Sunday church on Easter, what does the sign say out there? It says he is risen. Where did this come from? It comes all the way back to Tammuz. So it ain't just a sun. It's actually going back to the son of Nimrod that they really worship. But in order for them to try to save him, they save him through the sun. Go ahead and finish that. He is risen. Uh -huh. These familiar Good Friday and Easter rituals are clearly derived from pagan Babylonian practices. Okay, now go over to 320. So all that comes from pagan Babylonian practices. Mm. All right, at the top. By AD 95, the leadership of the Rome Church was fast abandoning the seven Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath for Sunday. Okay, so it says they were fastly by AD 95, the Roman Church they were fastly abandoning the seventh day Sabbath for Sunday. Go ahead. And the Nisan 14 Passover for Easter. Uh-huh, so they was getting rid of the Passover. Uh, we know we do Passover on the 14th day of the first month, right? So they was also getting rid of this in AD 95. Go ahead. Once the observance of Easter Sunday superseded, superseded, superseded the Christian Passover, uh -huh. the abandonment of the remaining biblical feasts, and holy days soon followed. So once they got rid of Passover, then all the rest of the uh, feast days of the Lord soon followed afterwards. Now, usually how it go, they get rid of one of them, then they can, if they can deceive your minds with a little bit, then they can get you with a lot. But it's slowly going to take place. That's kind of like what's going on with homosexuality. It started slowly. Now it's starting to take off real fast now. Because the world is going down in degradation. But that's what's happening here. Once they got rid of Passover, now they done got rid of all the Lord's feast days. And they got rid of what? The seventh day. All right, go ahead. These were quickly replaced with Christianized occult holidays. Uh huh. Christmas, Halloween, Lent, ETC. Yeah, Etc. And <laughs> ETC. Y'all see that? It says they were quickly repla replaced with Christianized occult holidays. Christmas, Halloween, and Lent. Alright? The highlight area, what does it say? In AD 135, the majority of church congregations and the Mediterranean region had already abandoned the true Passover in favor of Sunday communion. Uh -huh. And the early Easter sunrise And the yearly Easter sunrise service. So now you don't have a Passover no more. What do you have now? We have communion, correct? They do communion, what, every fourth Sunday? Sometimes every first Sunday. But this took place in AD 135. When most of the churches, majority of the congregations in the Mediterranean had already abandoned the true Passover. Go ahead and read. By AD 195, a mere 60 years later, the Orthodox Gentile bishops of Palestine had fully succumbed, Me, we will allow succumbed Succumb. to this onslaught. Uh -huh. It cannot be overstated that the first step in this departure from the true worship of God was the introduction of weekly Sunday worship by the leaders of Rome. Mm. So, in other words, in order for this to take place, this, had, this was given to you by Rome. And it started by what? It started by them attacking the Lord's Sabbath day. Once they got the Lord's Sabbath day, then everything else just started going down the drain. And notice, that's what you need to get salvation. Because once you start keeping the Lord's Sabbath, Sabbath day, then that's when you start opening up your understanding on all the other feast days, which all of them are a plan of salvation. But if you're not keeping the Lord's Sabbath day, then you're not going to understand what it is that you're supposed to do to get salvation. So go and read that. Samuel uh, Bacciotti writes to Rome what? Leading role in replacing the true Nisan 14 Passover with Easter Sunday. Uh-huh. So he wrote in replacing the true Nisan 14 Passover with Easter Sunday. What? There seems to be no question as to Rome being the place of its origin. So where did it come from? Rome. Rome. Go ahead. Later historical 
data confirm, in fact, the Rome origin of Easter Sunday. The Rome origin of Easter Sunday. Go ahead. J.B. Petro, for instance, has discovered and edited the concealer decree of the Council of Nicaea. 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 Mm -hmm. By Emperor Constantine in Good. A.D. 325. That's right. Go ahead. Concerning the celebration of Easter, where it specifically... Specifically in John. Uh -huh. Now read that highlight right there. What did I say? White footholds, for instance, that Rome and Alexandria adopted Easter Sunday to avoid using the symbols of Judaism. That's right. So they didn't want to have no ties to the holy days of the Lord, so they adopted their own. That's why they got rid of the Lord's Sabbath day. Now, let's go into the last two million years. And let's look at this a little further. This is the last history book. Because in order for you to understand what it is the world is doing, sometimes history, you know what I'm saying, will kind of shed a light on things. And that's what we have to do with teaching the Word of God. We read to you out of the Bible, and we also give you history, because a lot of times people don't want to look for themselves. But we'll do it for you, and we'll bring it out of class, you know, show you the wickedness that's going on in the world. All right, so this book is the last two million years. All right, page 144. Read the highlight there. Worship of the old gods did not die out at once. Mm -hmm. Gregory himself advised his missionaries to leave the pagan shrines alone and to try to introduce Christian worship only gradually alongside the pagan practices. So how was they going to introduce the, we talking about Roman Christianity, how they going to introduce it? Slowly next to what? Pagan practices. Alright? So over time, you know, you, I mean, you, you get taken away from the lower Sabbath day, then you brought in, they give you Sunday saying it's the day of the Lord. Then they tell you that Christ rose on Sunday. But they slowly do this. Then they put communion there. But they have to slowly do it. And now eventually over time, now what do you have as the Lord's Sabbath day that the world considers the Lord's Sabbath day Sunday? They think Monday is the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. But this is something that gradually had to happen. But now you can get a word of anything. They'll believe it because don't nobody read the Bible. Alright, so go over to the other page, the last page. Okay, go ahead and read. This mingling of Christianity and paganism is the reason why Chris, Christ's birthday is celebrated on December 25th, the date of the pagan's winter festival. Okay, so this is a celebration of the, the, the uh, Nimrod. This is why the Christians celebrate December 25th as Christ's birthday, because they slowly mingle the sun worship in, and said that this uh, Christ is born this. It has nothing to do with Jesus, brother and sister. All right, so let's go look at one more spot here. Go ahead and read. The organization of the church was itself imperial, with parishes grouped into dioceses. Mm -hmm. It had its own system of law, its own courts, its own taxes and tithes. And tithe. tithes. A 10% levy on the produce of all land. Uh -huh. Its clergy claimed ex Exemption. Exemption from paying taxes to kings of em or emperors and from being tried by secular courts. Secular courts, uh huh. So they, they, they can do anything they want to. That's kind of like the day Rome can do anything they want to in Vatican City. They can't be tried by secular courts because they consider what? So holy that you can't touch it. So it's the same thing going on today. But well, go ahead. Oh, um, their churches could even offer sanctuary to the king's enemies. Uh huh. Clergy could punish the dis disobedience, disobedient from find a man for absence from church. Uh huh. So the clergy could punish the disobedient, find a man from absence from church. We ain't talking about Sabbath church. We gonna see what church we talking about. Go ahead. Um, whip a woman for doing her washing on a Sunday. Oh, okay. So if you didn't come to church on Sunday. And if you and it, that's that's what they was talking about when they said they can find a man from being absent from church. And then if a woman was washing her clothes on Sunday, they had the permission to whoop her. But guess what? This gonna come back into play again. Go ahead and read. And hand over heretics to the state. And they hand over the heretics to the state. Go ahead. For burning. For what? For burning. This is coming out of Rome. This is when I gave you Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, Sunday worship. These are people that go around and talk so nice by way of these black preachers, these Gentile preachers. They talk so nice and they preach in love, but yet still the organization behind them is the ones that handed them over to the state for burning. Go ahead. 
their ultimate weapon was the power to excommunicate. Uh huh. So the ultimate power was the you know the power to excommunicate. In other words, well you know we gonna cut you off. You ain't gonna receive the blessings of the Lord like they get the power. The power was given to Israel anyway. But Israel ain't even given that power to cut somebody off. Go ahead and read. To cut a man off from the mercy of Christ. Uh huh. And so condemn his soul to eternal. Truth. Right. We don't have that power. But they make it seem like that. That's why you go get them for the hell marriage. And then the Lord, uh, uh, when you go to the to the dude, uh, what what they call the guy? When you go confess your sins to the, the so-called the yeah. father, then he he, he pardon you of your sin. Mm -hmm. But that's not their role. They can't do that. But we just letting you know, you know what I'm saying, who this is that's giving you what you got today. So read this right. This is called pagan rights absorbed. Go ahead. By a stroke of tactical genius, the church, while intolerant intolerant of pagan beliefs was believed was able to harness the powerful emotions generated by pagan worship uh -huh. often churches were cited where temples had stood before mm -hmm. and many heathen festivals were added to the Christ Christian, Christian calendar, Christian calendar. Uh -huh. so many heathen festivals mm -hmm. were added to the Christian calendar for instance uh -huh. a time of sacrifice and for, and rebirth in the Christian year okay so this rebirth really goes back to Tammuz he is risen, remember? Go ahead. Takes its name from the Norse goddess Eost Estra. Estra. Uh huh. In whose honor rites her rites were held every spring. Uh huh. She is she in turn was simply a northern version of the Phoen Phoenician Phoenician Earth Mother Astar. Uh huh. Astarte. Astarte. Goddess of fertility. Goddess of fertility. Go ahead. Easter eggs continue in old age. An age-old tradition in which the egg is a symbol of birth, mm -hmm. and cakes which were eaten to mark the festivals of the Sarte and Estra, where the dish direct, direct answers ancestors of our hot cross buns. Right. So all that stuff that you get, including the hot cross, hot cross buns, comes out of Rome. All right. But what they did was all this goes back to the worship of the sun. And they tied it into Easter, that's why they had a sunrise service on Easter. Sunrise service has, has nothing to do with the scriptures, brothers and sisters. But what they did was they take it from Sunday, they remove the Sabbath day, and they slowly start putting in the pagan worship. And the pagan worship goes, pagan is heathen customs. Okay? So what they did was they start putting in the different, uh, they slowly start putting in the pagan holidays, and took out the Lord's holy days, and now today the world is consumed in paganism. And a lot of people don't know that it goes back to sun worship. The world is on a mission to push the day of the sun god. Starting with Sunday. So starting with Sunday to the winter uh, festival of the unconquered sun, December 25th, all the way to Mother's Day and Father's Day, this all is the worshiping of the sun god. Alright, but it's not anything that's new. Alright, let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 8. Let's go look and see how long this has been around, brothers and sisters. Ezekiel chapter 8. Because Tammuz and the sun, they all go hand in hand. And it's not anything that was new for uh, uh, as far as us right now. Just because you're just not hearing about it, that don't mean it's new. But if you go back and look at the history of it, you'll see that everything has an origin. Alright, so Ezekiel chapter 8, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Let's skip down to verse 5. Go ahead. And it came to pass in the sixth year, mm -hmm. in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, mm -hmm. as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, mm -hmm. that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Uh -huh. Verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thy eyes now, now the way toward the north. So now the Lord is dealing with Ezekiel, and he's going to show him some things. He's going to tell him to dig into the wall, go look into the wall, and he's going to see what's going on. But go ahead and read. So I lifted up my eyes uh -huh. the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entrance. That's right, that image of jealousy was Christ, because he told us what, I the Lord am a jealous God, don't have no other God before me. Skip down to verse 8. Go ahead. Then said he unto me, Son of man, 
dig now in the wall, mm -hmm. and when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. That's right, because now the Lord is showing him all these great abominations that took place. So he told him to dig into the wall. Once he dig into the wall, he's going to look and start seeing some of the things that was taking place. But go ahead and read. And he said unto me, uh -huh. go in, and behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. Go ahead. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, uh -huh. and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. That's right, go ahead. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censers in his hand. Uh -huh. And a thick cloud of incense went up. That's right, go ahead. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Uh -huh. Every man in the chambers of his imagery, of his imagery? For they say, the Lord see us not. Uh -huh. The Lord have forsaken the earth. And that's why you can't give nobody the word of God. I can't say nobody, but for the most part, you can't give right, uh, a lot of people the word of God. They feel like it's all a game. They feel like they're going to die and go to heaven. They feel like they don't have to do nothing inside this book, but that's exactly what was going on back then. That's why they say, the Lord see us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Verse 13. He said also unto me, uh -huh. turn thee yet again, Go ahead. and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. That's right. So these abominations, it's a person, a thing that is disgusting, something that, something that the Lord hates. So he said, turn yet again, I'm going to show you greater abominations that they do. Go ahead. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, uh -huh. which was toward the north. Go ahead. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. So what we was just reading about, they was doing this for a long time, brothers and sisters. I'm just showing you in the history books that it's still in existence. But it says he showed him and then he seen that women weeping for Tammuz. Ain't that what we saw that the women were doing? They're beating themselves and trying to feel the affliction of Jesus. And then afterwards, Saturday night, when they go on to Sunday, they say, what? He is risen. So everybody laughing and everybody, you know, in good spirits now. But we saw that this was a festival that was similar to what? The worshiping of what? Tammuz. Go ahead and read. 15. Uh-huh. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this? Go ahead. O son of man. Uh-huh. Turn thee yet again. And thou shalt see greater abominations than these. So he finna show him something worse than this. Bad enough you crying for Tammuz. Y'all done made him a god. Y'all ain't gonna let him die. You're gonna keep resurrecting him every year. But let me show you what else they doing. Keep reading. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Uh -huh. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord. So now we in the Lord's house. Go ahead. Between the porch and the altar. Uh-huh were about five and twenty men mm -hmm. with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Go ahead. What are they, what are they? And their faces toward the east. Go ahead. And they worship the sun toward the east. And they worship the sun, brothers and sisters. So this is something that's been going on for a long time. This ain't nothing new. But the Lord called this a greater abomination. This is why it's so important for you to know how to keep the Lord's Sabbath day. This is a great abomination when he told us not to do this. In Jeremiah 10, he told you what? Learn not to wear the heathen. Mm -hmm. Don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. He told you in Genesis chapter 1 that they were for what? Signs and for seasons and for days and for years. He made two great lights. One light greater than the other to get what? Light upon the earth. The greater light the rule of day, the lesser light the rule of night. Not for us to bow down and worship these. So tomorrow, on Sunday, that's what they're going to be doing. On Christmas, that's what they're going to be doing. Worshiping the sun god. Now you got your tree to actually represent this sun god. You're going to bow down up under him to get those gifts. That's what you worship. And the Lord see that. The Lord called this an abomination. Something that he hates. And he's going to deal with everybody that continue to put off his Sabbath day. Now let's go a little further and let's look at this, uh, uh, look at this man. Daniel chapter 7. 
And then we're going to get back to the Lord's seventh day. Daniel chapter 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1. When you get it, go ahead. In the first year of Belshazzar, uh -huh. king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head, of his head upon his bed. Uh -huh. Then he wrote the dream and told the psalm of the matter. Go ahead. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, uh -huh. and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. All right, so these four winds of heaven that strove upon the great sea, the sea are the people. The four winds, we are talking about the Gentile dynasty, brothers and sisters. Starting from the Medo, -Per uh, uh, the Babylonian Empire, down to the Medo-Persian Empire, down to the Greek Empire, down to the Roman Empire. These are the four winds. All right, so skip down to verse eight, and let's look at this last beast that came out of this Gentile dynasty. Verse seven. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. After this, I saw in the night visions, uh -huh. and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, uh -huh. and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces, uh -huh. and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Go ahead. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, uh -huh. and it had ten horns. That's right, because see this beast right here, now he going to come, and he going to start grabbing on to things as far as, you know, anything dealing with religion. All other kings weren't really dealing with that. They knew about God and stuff like that, but they weren't really trying to rule that way. Now this last one, he going to come, and he going to get you spiritually. Now this is that great and terrible beast. Verse 8, go ahead. I considered the horns, uh -huh. and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Uh -huh. So out of these ten horns that came up out of this last kingdom, it's going to be another one that's going to come up. Another little horn. This little horn is going to represent that religious power. And today this religious power is coming out of the Roman Empire. He is called Papa, or the Pope. Go ahead and read before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up. Uh -huh, that's right, because when he came into power, he took three of those, uh, uh, three of those, you know, still out of the same dynasty, uh, still out of the same empire, he took three of them down. All right, go ahead. By the roots, uh -huh. and behold, and, and, and this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, uh -huh. and a mouth speaking great and things. Let's go see some of them great things that he was going to speak. Skip down to verse 25 and go ahead. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. He gonna speak great words against who? The Most High. And he already doing that today. That's why he came out a couple weeks ago and told you that atheists can go to heaven. How you gonna go to heaven? You don't believe in the Lord. You ain't going to heaven anyway. But I'm just saying, even if you had a, even if that was possible for you to go to the third heaven, how you gonna go to heaven and you don't believe in God? This is. The one that's going to speak great words against the Most High. The Lord going to tell you something. He going to come. And he going to twist it. It's going to have a little truth to it. That for instance like. You know you're going to get up. As you get old. And you're going to see. When you get your house. you going to, uh, Your family. You're going to go out. Get that Christmas tree. Bring it in the house. Get those gifts for them kids. And you're going to tell them kids. Jesus Christ was born on this day. Has nothing to do with Jesus. But he put that name on it. So by him putting that name on it, tying his name to it, and they also considered him the holiest man in the world, then you're going to feel like you are doing something to please the Lord. But that's how that deception come in. And that's what he's going to do. The Lord told you in Jeremiah chapter 10 that you're not supposed to bring a tree in your house and deck in the silver and gold. But he's going to allow it you to do it, he gonna make you think it's okay. The Lord gonna tell you that if a man lie with mankind like he lie with a woman, they should surely be put to death. His blood should be upon his own head. He gonna tell you that, the Pope gonna tell you we need to accept everybody, no matter how they are. And he gonna use his little minions to say what? Come as you are. The Lord accept you no matter how you are. Not the God of this Bible, but these are Examples of how he's going to speak great words against the Most High. But let's look at some more things he's going to do. Keep reading. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So these saints that the world call themselves that they serve the Lord, they say he's going to wear out the saints of the Most High. But he ain't talking about the saints 
you know, the people that call themselves saints and worshiping according to the world, he's talking about the real saints, the ones that's keeping the Sabbath day, the ones who got understanding, serving the Lord. These are the saints that's going to get caught in the great tribulation. That's not going to make it out of here. This, this is who we're coming for. Go ahead and read it. And thank to change times and laws. And going to thank to change times and laws. That's why when you look at 12 o'clock midnight, he tell you it's a new day. But the Lord said in the beginning of the lesson when we uh, started, what makes a day? The evening and the morning makes a day. So when the sun go down this evening, we going into another day. Not 12 o'clock midnight. The Lord is a practical God. You can see the change happen. When a new day come in, you see it's dark outside. Every day. Every day. It does that. And then seven times in a week, you come to the Sabbath day. It's that simple. It's the seventh day a day of rest. The seventh day of the week. Seven sons. All right, seven sons completes one week. And when you get to that seventh son going down, then you go into the Sabbath day of the week. All right, go ahead and read. And they shall be given into his hand uh -huh. until a time and a time and the dividing of time. That's right. And we are talking about that man of sin, that little horn that came up by the Roman Empire. So now let's turn over to Genesis chapter 2. Let's get back to the Sabbath day. Genesis chapter 2. There shouldn't be no problem, you know, celebrating the Lord's Sabbath day, brothers and sisters. Everything else, you know, people want you to abide by. They don't want you killing, from, killing. they don't want you stealing from them. They don't want you talking about them. But they don't want to keep the Sabbath day. And that Sabbath day was put in place before everything else came in line. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, what does it say, brother? God blessed the seventh day, uh -huh. sanctified it, Go ahead. because that in it he had rested from all his work, uh -huh. which God created and made. That's right. So we read that again. From what we're looking at, it looked like the Lord rest from everything he had created and made. Verse 4. Go ahead. These are the generations of the heaven and of the earth. Now, people don't understand this. This is what get me, right? A lot of people think that the Lord created the heaven and the earth in seven literal days. But what did you just read, Brother DeMarcus? Now, what did you just read? Read that scripture. Oh, my bad. Verse 3. Uh-huh. No, I'm sorry. Verse, verse 4. Go ahead. These are the generations of the heavens. It says what? These are the generations of the heavens and what? And of the earth. And the earth when? When they were created. Uh-huh. In the day, in the day, there's so a generation is what? One generation is a hundred, right? But that's say that says generations, correct? It says in the day. So in this day you had generations take place. So it couldn't have been one literal day, brothers and sisters. People don't read the Bible. But if you read and stop trying to follow what these false prophets tell you, the Lord will give you understanding on what he put inside his word of God. This day is actually talking about, well, we'll, we'll look at it. I ain't going to say it yet. We'll, we'll look at it. But keep reading. In the day that the Lord God made the earth uh -huh. and the heavens. Go ahead. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. Uh -huh. And every herb of the field before it grew. Go ahead. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Uh -huh. And there was not a man to till the ground. But we just saw in Genesis 1 and 26 at the beginning that God said, let us make man in our image. So from us reading that, we think man is already here, right? right. But when we go to Genesis chapter 2, it says that there was not a man to till the ground. So we got a problem here. But we're going to deal with it because it ain't no problem. He gave the understanding of his will. It's our job to teach. Verse 5, what does it say, brother? But there went up a six, mist. Uh, six, I'm sorry, go ahead. But there went up a mist from the earth uh -huh. and watered the whole face of the ground. Uh -huh. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Go ahead. And breath and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, uh -huh. and man became a living soul. So when did man become a living soul? On what day? What day did man become a living soul, brothers and sisters? Six. On the sixth day, right? Alright, so man became a living soul on the sixth day. We're gonna put this down as what? Day one. 
That's when man became a living soul on day one, right? Right. All right. Go ahead and read. Genesis three. All right. That's it on that. Okay, yeah, now let's go on to three. Let's go on to Genesis 3, and uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Thank you, brother. All right, now, we see that the Lord, uh, man became a living soul. Then we see that he also put, we didn't read it, but you can go back and read it on your own time. Finish reading chapter 2, and you'll see that the Lord had also he put out the sleep, took a rib from his body, and brought the woman also. All right, so this woman got the message about not eating from the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right, so now we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead and read Genesis 3 and verse 1. What does it say, brother? Now the serpent was, a more, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Uh-huh. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Go ahead. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Uh -huh, so she knew something. She said we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But what? But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it. Lest ye die. That's right. Go ahead and read. And the servant said unto the woman. Ye shall not surely die. Uh -huh. For God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be open, uh -huh. and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right, so now, that's a little bit of truth in there. They was going, you know, once they ate up, they were going were gonna to be as gods, knowing good and evil. But the catch was that the Lord told her not to eat from it. If you ate from it, what was going to happen? You're going to surely die. What did Satan say? You should not surely die. That's the deception right there. And that's the same thing that he's telling them today. You ain't going to die. You're going to go off to heaven. You're going to sit on the throne with the Lord, and you're going to look down when you die. That's what every time they have a funeral, what they tell you? That she done went off, or he done went off to heaven. You should not surely die. That's what they tell you. Ain't nothing changing, brothers and sisters. It's just coming in a different form now. It's coming through man now. The first time it came through Satan the devil himself, and the Lord blocked that off. So now he uses man to deceive me. The same as that thing. Go ahead and read. By the words. Go to this. Verse 6. Uh-huh. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh -huh. and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, Go ahead. she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Uh-huh. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Okay, so now we see that both of them have ate from the tree that they were forbidden to eat from, right? Mm -hmm. So now at this time the Lord gonna come down to the garden, they gonna hide themselves, the Lord gonna ask them. You know what I'm saying? He said, I hid myself because I knew I was naked. He said, who told you you was naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat of? So now the Lord is getting ready to pass out punishment and he's gonna get this man out of his garden. All right, so we gonna look down a little further there. Skip down to verse 22 and go ahead. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, uh -huh. to know good and evil. Go ahead. And now, lest he put forth his hand, uh -huh. and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. That's right, go ahead. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, mm -hmm. to till the ground from whence he, has, whence he was taken. Go ahead. So he drove out the man, and he placed it at the east of the garden of Eden. Cherubs and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. All right, so now he done kicked this man out of the garden. Then he also told him before that he told him in verse uh, 17, In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. All right, so this means, you know, until you die, you're going to have to work. But how long does this man have to work? Six days. six days. We got to look at the six days. All right, but let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Mm. Leviticus chapter 23. If this man had to work forever, well, we would be in trouble. Because, man, I can't stand working. I do it because I got to, but I can't stand it. Not one bit. 
I think I'm like my forefather, Jacob like to dwell in tents. <laughs> I like to dwell in tents, man. Shoot, if I could sit up under air conditioning all day, I would. But hey, you gotta do what we gotta do. So Leviticus 23 and verse 1, what does it say, brother? And the Lord spake unto Moses, I uh -huh, say, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, uh -huh. concerning the feast of the Lord. Concerning the feast of the Lord. That has an S on it. Go ahead. Which ye shall proclaim to be a holy convocation. Uh -huh. Even these are my feasts. Even these are my feasts. Go ahead and read. Six days shall work be done, uh -huh. but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the rest. Go ahead. And holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwellings. All right, so how many days should work be done? Six. Six days, right? The man was cast out, he got a tiller ground. For how many days? Six. Six days, right? And what day he's supposed to rest on? Seven. Seven, right? All right, we're going to look at this later. Okay, now, let's go over to Psalm chapter 95. Psalm chapter 95 and verse 6. And y'all notice something that we just read in Leviticus 23. This is not, this is this Sabbath that we're talking about. Notice what it said. It's a feast of the Lord. Are we talking about a physical feast? No. We're not talking about physical because on the Lord's Sabbath day, he said what? No work. He didn't say no servile work on the weekly Sabbath. He says no work. On the annual feast, he says no servile work. But on this weekly feast, it's no work at all. Wait till after class. All right, now, we're going to go over to Psalm 95 and pick it up at verse 6. When you get it, go ahead and read. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Uh -huh. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Go ahead. For he is our God, mm -hmm. and we are the people of his pasture. Go ahead. And the sheep of his hand. Go ahead. Today, if ye will hear his voice, uh -huh. hard not your heart, as in the provocation, go ahead. and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. That's right, go ahead. When your fathers tempted me, uh -huh. proved me, and saw my work. And that's right, when you get into the scriptures, the Exodus, and Numbers, and Leviticus, and you and Deuteronomy, you know, you see what, it's mainly Exodus, and Numbers, you see how, you know, the Israelites, how they tempted the Lord, and they want to go serve other gods and stuff like that. How they came at the Lord, you know, through Moses. And was saying different things like, why you brought us out here? Could have left us out there when we was in Egypt. We ate from the flesh pots. We had all this. Wasn't that uh, type of beans? We were talking about leeks and all that type of garlics and onions and all that type of stuff. They was tempting the Lord. And that's what he's talking about. Many different things that they did. But he said, when they tempted me, proved me and saw my works. What else? Verse 10. Forty years long. Was I grieved with this generation? Uh -huh. And I said, it is a people that do err Go ahead. in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. Uh -huh. Until whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. So why we got to worry about entering into his rest? Didn't the Lord rest? According to what we saw in Genesis chapter 1, it said, and as we went into chapter 2, it said he... Six days he worked and on the seventh day he rested, right? So why is he talking about they ain't going to enter into his rest. Why is he swearing in his wrath that they ain't going to enter into his rest? Maybe it's pointing to something more than we understand, brothers and sisters. Let's turn over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. We are in good time. Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to pick this up at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 4, you want to read? Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. When you get it, go ahead and read. Let us therefore fear, uh -huh. lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short. Okay, so now Paul is even talking about, you know, let us fear lest a promise being left of us enter into his rest, we should come short of it. So why are we talking about entering into a rest? What rest are we talking about? Is there another rest? Because Jesus, 
according to what we read in Genesis, rested on the seventh day. So how are we going to come short of entering into his rest? Go ahead and read verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached, uh -huh. as well as unto them. Go ahead. So just like we get in the gospel, just like the Lord is uh, uh, by way of pouring out his spirit now today, giving us the word of God, telling us to turn back and keep the commandments, and obey my voice, that's the same thing, the same gospel that was preached to them. Go ahead and read. As well as unto them. Uh -huh. But the word preached did not profit them. Go ahead. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard. And that's what will get you cut off. You can hear the word, but it's your faith that's going to cause you to keep the word of God. If you're not doing what the scriptures tell you to do, then what good is you even having the scriptures sitting in front of you? You might as well be just like the ones that are in God. But he says some of them enter not into in, in, enter into because of unbelief. Go ahead and read. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, uh -huh. as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, that's right. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So Paul said, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. When the foundation of the world was finished, what took place? It said that he rested on the seventh day. So if he rested on the seventh day, then why is he talking about we going uh, uh, why did he swear in his wrath that they should not enter into his rest? Go ahead and read. Verse 4. Uh-huh. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Uh-huh. God did rest the seventh day from all his work. And then we read that. Then we read that in Genesis, what it said, it said he rested on the seventh day. Didn't we see that in Genesis, right? Okay, go ahead. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. And now we saw that also. In this place, what we're reading right now. So if he rested on the Sabbath day, and now we are uh, 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 in Genesis, if he already rested after he created everything, and now he's talking about we got to keep his word to enter into his rest, that means he must have two restes, right? Or does he have two rests? We got to find out. Go ahead and read. Seeing therefore it remain that some must enter therein. Uh -huh. And they to whom it was first preached enter enter not in because of unbelief. Okay, so in other words, the people that he told in the Old Testament, the Israelites, they didn't enter into his rest because of unbelief. However, it still remains a rest for us to enter into, and if we don't do what he say, if we don't have the faith of God, then we're going to get cut off and we ain't going to enter into it also. Go ahead and read. Verse 7. Uh-huh. Again, he lived a certain day saying, and David, today, after so long a time, uh -huh. as it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, hard not your heart. That's right, hard not your heart. So when you hear the word of God, hard not your heart. Submit yourself to the word of God. Don't be like your forefathers in the wilderness that tempted the Lord and, you know what I'm saying, that was kicking against the Lord and ended not in because of unbelief. Go ahead. For if Jesus had given them rest, uh -huh. then would he not afterward have spoken of another That's day? That's not a question, brother. Read that again. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? That's right. That's not a question. Stop ending it like you're uh, doing a question mark. It says, then, uh, it says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? He let you know if the rest was already given back then, then why are we talking about entering to rest right now today? If the rest was already given back then. Go ahead and read. There remain therefore a rest to the people of God. Because it's another rest. Not another rest. It's the ultimate rest that we're waiting on. Go ahead and read. For he that is entered into his rest he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Uh -huh. Now, that's what it said in the scripture. It said that he rested from his works, didn't it? It says so. It says, for he that is entered into his rest, whose rest? Christ's rest. 
he had also ceased from his own works. Because during that day of rest, you ain't got to work. It's a Sabbath day. So ain't going to be no working going on, brothers and sisters. All right, but it also says, he had also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Did God really rest from his works yet? Did God cease from his works yet? No. Because it's still flesh and blood on this earth. When his flesh and blood is off of this earth, then he has ceased from his works. But he said it in a certain place that he rests on the seventh day. We're going to look and show you why he said that though. Go ahead and read let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest. Okay, that's so, rest. That's right. So we got to labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, into Jesus' rest, into that day of rest. We're working to get into that day. This is why we're keeping the Lord's Sabbath day. Go ahead and read, brother. Lest any man fall at the same example of unbelief. That's right. Unless we fall just like they fell in the wilderness. So we got to labor, we got to work, we got to keep our garments white so we can make it into this Sabbath day. But let's go look and see why we're talking about different rests here. We're talking about the same rest, but the world don't know. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, and we're going to pick it up at verse 9. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. If only the world understood the Lord's Sabbath day. If only the world stood Genesis chapter 1. Understood Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 1. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. What it say, brother? Remember the former things of old. Uh-huh. For I am God. Go ahead. There is none else. I am God. There is none like me. That's right. Declaring the end from the beginning. What does he do? Declaring the end from the beginning. So when you saw Genesis chapter 1... He declared the end all the way from the beginning. He letting you know the whole plan all the way in the end from the time where he started. Go ahead and read. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So you see that? It said in verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are what? Not yet done. Done. So when you're looking at Genesis chapter 1 and it goes into Genesis chapter 2 and it says that he rested on the seventh day, that's the blueprint. That's the plan of God. But he actually didn't rest. This is why we're talking about another day of rest. This is why we got to labor, therefore, to enter into his rest because the Lord ain't rested yet. That's the blueprint. He just called it from the beginning. That's what you read. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 1. And then when you go into Genesis chapter 2, the plan starts to come into effect. But when, by the time you get to day 7, man done fell off the boat. Sin done came on the scene. So guess what? Now we got to go a whole 7 days now for the Lord to actually enter into his rest. Because he never entered into his rest right here. That was the plan for him to enter into his rest. Let's sit on that, brother. Yes. Let's go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Y'all understand, brothers and sisters? Yes. Y'all understand? Yes, sir. You understand, brother? Praise the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 8. That's why he told them in Psalms 95 that they weren't going to enter into his rest. Whom I swear in my wrath, they should not enter into my rest. Remember in the Old Testament, Jesus is the one that's talking. Now when Paul is speaking in Hebrews, he's telling us the same thing. Labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. We talking about the Sabbath day of the Lord, brothers and sisters. It ain't take place yet. But this was the original plan. Day one, two, three, four, five, six. The man came on the scene, and this is the day that the Lord was supposed to rest. But just like the Lord had a blueprint of seven days, he also gave man seven days. Okay. All right, now. 
Second Peter chapter three, verse eight. And you get to go ahead and read, bro. But beloved, uh -huh. be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. One day with the Lord is what? A thousand years. A thousand years. Okay? So when y'all looking at Genesis, chapter 1, the first day, second day, third day, the Lord, a day to the Lord is one thousand years, brothers and sisters. These are not literal days. That's why we saw in Genesis chapter 2, we saw the generations. You know, that was created in that day. Because to the Lord, one day is a thousand years. So now let's go over to Revelation chapter 20. And let's go look at us coming into the Lord's Sabbath day now. Yeah, go ahead and finish that, brother. And a thousand years as one day. And a thousand years as one day. So let's go Revelation 20. We're going to look at the Lord's plan. I mean the Lord's day. You right? Ooh. I took it already. Thank you. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. And go ahead. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, uh -huh. having to kill the bottomless pit, go ahead. and a great chain in his hand. Uh -huh. And he and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That's right. So when Christ get back, he gonna bound Satan for a thousand years. One of the questions on the table is that I always ask, you know, people that's, you know, so call themselves so educated in the word. I say, well, okay, why is the Lord gonna bound Satan, uh, bound Satan for a thousand years? Why he ain't gonna bound him forever? But go ahead and read. And cast him into the bottomless pit. Uh huh. And shut him up. And set a seal upon him mm -hmm. that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. That's right. So when a thousand years are up, then he coming back out of that bottomless pit. So you think everything is done, everything is complete, but he's gonna be locked away for one thousand years. Why? Because a thousand years to the Lord is what one day. Now we have entered into what the Lord's Sabbath day now. So when the Lord comes to his Sabbath day, you can't have Satan running around here. That's supposed to represent what? Peace. And we saw in Leviticus 23 that that's going to be what? A feast of the Lord. That's why the Lord said, even these are my feasts. Speaking to the children of Israel concerning the feast of the Lord, even these are my feasts. So if these are his feasts, and it's pointing to something else, it's pointing to the day, the Sabbath day of the Lord, when he's going to come back on this earth, and ain't going to be no more war going on. Satan ain't going to be able to go out to deceive the nations anymore. You're going to still have some knuckleheads and the Lord going to deal with them, but Satan ain't going to be out doing what he want to do no more. No more wars and stuff like that. A thousand years of peace. But you know it's still going to be some sinners on there because that's why the Lord said uh, uh, a child, I think a sinner going to die a hundred years old or something like that. So somebody going to you know, break the law and the Lord going to have to get out. All right, but go ahead and read, brother. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Uh-huh. So I, after that, he's going to be loosed a little season. After the thousand years are complete, because at this time, we're ending the Sabbath day. All right, go ahead. And I saw thrones. Uh-huh. And they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Now, what does that say? It says, I saw thrones. Not just one throne. I saw thrones. And judgment was given unto them. Go ahead. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, for the witness of Jesus uh -huh. and for the word of God. Go ahead. And which had not worshipped the beast, uh -huh. neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads uh -huh. or in their hands. Go ahead. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So that's why we're keeping the Lord's Sabbath day now. Because when he get back, we want to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. It's going to be a, you know, it's going to succeed into the next kingdom. But we want to live and we want to go ahead and take on our immortality, get our bodies, our reward at that time. Go ahead and read, brother. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Uh -huh. This is the first resurrection. And this first resurrection is the Sabbath day of the Lord. All right, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Uh-huh. On such the second death have no power. That's right. So we make it in the first resurrection, brothers and sisters, then we are clear from the lake of fire. 
That's why it says that blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. On such the second death have no power. In other words, you can't die no more. Matter of fact, you ain't even got to worry about hitting the lake of fire. On top of that, you're going to be sitting on the thrones judging the world. They're going to be coming up to you and you have to pass out their sentence. That's something good. Instead of being on the other side of that and somebody passing out the sentence to you. Go ahead and read, brother. But they shall be priests of God uh -huh. and of Christ. Go ahead. And shall reign with him a thousand years. So we just learned something on the way to learning something. Who's going to be the priest? Who's going to be teaching in Christ's kingdom? We are. We are. Because it just said they're going to be what? They're going to be priests of God. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. So in the kingdom, the ones who are going to be teaching the gospel, teaching the word, is us. The ones who make this thing and take on that first resurrection now. All right? Now, let's go back and look at Isaiah chapter 14. Because we saw that Satan going to be cast to the bottomless pit. But let's go look at it from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. We got two more places after this, and that's it. Isaiah chapter 14, the verse 1. Go ahead and read, brother. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, uh -huh. and will yet choose Israel. Go ahead. And set them in their own land. Uh -huh. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. That's right. And this is during the time when the Lord get back and set up his kingdom on this earth. When he gathered Israel, he's going to put them back in their own land. And they're going to cleave to the house of Jacob. Go ahead. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for service and handmaid. Uh -huh. And they shall take them captives, Go ahead. whose captives they were. Uh -huh. And they shall rule over their oppressors. That's right. So during this time, Israel, you know, if you ain't taking on your spiritual body, Israel physically are going to take them captive whose captives they were. They ain't going to be in captivity anymore. At this time, Israel and everybody that keeping the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God, they're going to have their inheritance split up between them. And everything going to run through Israel. Everything going to run through the seed of Jacob. At this time, they're coming out of captivity. Go ahead and read. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest. He's going to give them what? Give thee rest. And this is the day we're trying to enter into, brothers and sisters. He's going to give thee rest from what? From thy sorrow. Uh -huh. And from thy fear. Go ahead. And from the hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve. So this is when Israel is going to be brought out of captivity. This is when Israel is going to rest. Until that time, Israel is still working. Now, I mean captivity. At the bottom of the barrel. Now all the so the Adam are working. You know what I'm saying? To take to, to get out from under this, this curse that we're up under. But Israel as a nation is, in, uh, is still in captivity and serving out hard bondage. It may not be hard here in America, but some places they still serving it out hard. But we still at the bottom of the totem pole. Go ahead and read. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. And this king of Babylon is talking about the one that's behind the physical king. We talking about Satan the devil. Go ahead and read, brother. And say, mm -hmm. I'll have the oppressor cease. Go ahead. The golden city ceased. Uh -huh. And that's that Babylon. Babylon is falling, is falling. How has it ceased? How has it came to an end? Go ahead. The Lord hath broken the staff of uh -huh. the wicked. That's right. Go ahead. And the scripture of the rule. The scepter of the rule. The, the scepter of the rule. Uh -huh. And that rulership, the Lord has taken it away from them. Go ahead. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, uh -huh. he that ruled the nations in anger uh -huh. is persecuted Go ahead. and none hindered. That's right. So all the wars and stuff that's going on, you know what I'm saying? All this wickedness that's going on, this is how you ruling the nation in anger. Go ahead and read. The whole earth is at rest. The whole earth is at what? At rest. At rest. And what else? And it's quiet. Uh -huh. What takes place when the earth is at rest and it's quiet? They break forth into sing. They break forth into sing, brothers and sisters. And this is that day that we're looking to uh, enter into. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. You're going to pick it up at verse 1. You get to go ahead and read, brother. Cry aloud, mm -hmm. spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Go ahead. Show my people their transgressions 
and the house of Jacob their sins. That's right. So we supposed to be telling the world of their sins. We supposed to go to Israel and tell them, hey man, you got to turn back to the law, statutes, and commandments. The scriptures tell you the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. And Israel is supposed to be on the job preaching this gospel. But how are you going to let them know what they're supposed to do if you can't go to them and tell them what, you know, what they sin is? As soon as you tell them what you know that what they gotta turn from, what they say, you can't judge me. You know what I'm saying? But we see in the scriptures, the scriptures say what? Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sin. And that's what the word of God is for. Go ahead and read verse 2. Yet they seek me daily. Uh-huh, and they do. They're gonna be seeking you tomorrow. What else they do? And delight to know my ways. Uh-huh. As a nation that did righteousness Go ahead. and forsook not the ordinance of their God, uh -huh. they ask of me the ordinance of justice. Go ahead. They take delight in approaching to God. Go ahead. Wherefore have we fasted? Say, say they, uh -huh. and thou seest not. That's right. We fasted, but you don't see us. You know what I'm saying? All this stuff we doing, but we ain't getting no results. But what else? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, uh -huh. and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure, and exact all labor, all your labor. That's right. In the day of your fast, you find pleasure, and exact all your labors, and what else? Behold, ye fast for strife, mm -hmm. and debate, and to and to smite with the fist of wickedness. That's right. And that's what they really fasting for. It says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and what else? Ye shall not fast as ye do this day uh -huh. to make your voice to be heard on high. That's right. Skip down to verse uh, 6 and go ahead. Is not this the fast that I have chosen uh -huh. to loose the bands of the wickedness? So this is the fast that they're supposed to be, you know, seeking. This is what the Lord has chosen. Loose the bands of the wickedness and what else? To undo the heavy burdens uh -huh. and to let the oppressed go free. Go ahead. And that ye break every yoke. Uh huh. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? That's right. We talking about the word here. We're supposed to be giving the word graciously to the nation, not trying to sit up and hold it and you know try to keep it for yourself. You're gonna give the bread to the hungry, the one who's seeking the word of God. This is you gonna give this to. Go ahead and read. And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. Uh huh. When thou seest the naked. That thou cover them. Go ahead. And that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. Uh huh. Go ahead. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, uh -huh. and thy health shall spring forth speedily. That's right. When you start doing the fast that I have chosen, what else? And thy righteousness shall go before thee. Uh huh. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Go ahead. Then, then. Huh? It says reap reward, reap reward. Uh -huh. Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Uh -huh. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. Uh -huh. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, uh -huh. the speaking vanity. Go ahead. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, Go ahead. then shall thy light rise and obscure it, uh -huh. and thy darkness be as the noonday. That's right. So your darkness, you're not understanding. The Lord gonna give you understanding. He's gonna bring that knowledge to you if you start taking on the fast that He chose. Go ahead and read. And the Lord shall guide thee continually uh -huh. and satisfy thy soul in drought. That's right. Go ahead. So even in the time of the drought. That's what's going on now today. It's a drought going on. But the Lord, the scripture said what? The Lord going to satisfy your soul in the drought. Don't nobody understand the word of God. It's a drought going forth in the, in the land. That's why you got other people up trying to teach, but the Lord done blocked But he said he going to satisfy your soul in the drought. He going to pour out his spirit on you. He going to give you the word of God. That's what he's talking about. That's why I told the lady at the well, if you would have asked me, I would have gave you everlasting water. Well, you would never thirst again. So this is what he's talking about when he say he's going to satisfy your soul in the drought. He's going to give you that word. He's going to part that word, brothers and sisters. Go ahead and read. And make fat thy bones. Uh-huh. Thou shalt be like a water garden. Go ahead. And like a spring of water mm -hmm. whose waters fell not. Go ahead. And they that shall be of thee 
shall build the old waste places. Uh -huh. Thou shall raise up the foundations of my generations. Many generations. Many generations. Uh -huh. And thou shall be called the repairer of the breach, uh -huh. the restorer of the path to dwell That's in. That's right. So in talking to Israel, if they come back to keep his word, do what he say, you're going to be called the restorer of the breach. You're going to show them the paths that they're supposed to dwell, the, the restorer of the paths to dwell they in. But how they gonna see it? Because they're gonna see that Israel is now back on the job, walking the way they're supposed to walk. But it's a condition that comes with this. Let's see what that condition is. First, verse 13, what it said, bro? Thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath. In other words, if you turn away your pleasures and your desires from doing what it is you want to do on the Lord's Sabbath day, what else? From doing thy pleasures on my holy day. On his holy day, go ahead. And call the Sabbath of delight, uh -huh. the holy of the Lord honorable, uh -huh. and shall honor him. Not doing what? Not doing thy own ways, Go ahead. nor finding thy own pleasure, uh -huh. nor speaking thy own words. Then what's going to take place? Then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord. And what are you going to do? And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. Go ahead. And feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. Go ahead. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. And that's why we're keeping the Lord Sabbath day. This is what we're looking forward to, brother and sister. Because that heritage is what? That promise that he promised to you. And that's what he's going to give us at the set time when we just keep the Lord's Sabbath. They turn away our foot from doing our own pleasures. Stop trying to be, you know, fitting in with the world. Stop trying to please them. The world is going to have to pay for the wickedness that they're doing, brothers and sisters. Right now, the Lord is just long suffering. That's why the scriptures say a day to the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. So he just long suffering, he giving them a time, giving them time to get it together. But just like he gave us time to get it together, that's the patience you gotta have with the world also. Mm -hmm. Alright, so let's go over to the last place. Isaiah chapter 56, and we're gonna pick it up at verse 1. Well, actually there's another place that we're gonna show you something. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 1. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Thus saith the Lord, uh -huh. keep ye judgments and do justice. Go ahead. For my salvation is near to come, uh -huh. and my righteousness to be revealed. That's right. So he's telling you to keep ye judgment, do justice, for my salvation is near to come. That salvation is when he get back on this earth. All right, go ahead. Blessed is the man that doeth this, uh -huh. and the son of man that live hold on it. To do what? That keep the Sabbath from polluting it and keep his hand from doing any evil. That's right, so now we're talking about the Lord's Sabbath day. He said, blessed is a man that do it, there's a son of man that lay hold on it, that keep the Sabbath from polluting it. So you shouldn't be going out buying and selling on the Sabbath day. You shouldn't be outside washing your car on the Sabbath day, playing video games, basketball and football on the Lord's Sabbath day. That's how you pollute the Sabbath day. But the Lord say, blessed is the man that do this and the son of man that lay hold on it. The son of man, he ain't talking about just Israel. He's talking about all nations. Go ahead and read. Neither let the son of the stranger, so including the stranger, the one who is not an Israelite in the flesh, he said, neither let the son of the stranger that what? That have joined himself to the Lord. That's right. This, this stranger that have decided to follow the God of this Bible, he shouldn't have nobody telling him that he can't receive salvation or he can't partake in the Lord's feast days and holy days. That's why the scriptures say, neither let the son of the stranger that have joined himself to the Lord speak, saying what? The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. That's right. So we ain't talking about Gentiles in the mind, brothers and sisters. We talking about strangers here in the flesh. That's why the scriptures say, don't let the son of the stranger say that the Lord have utterly separated me from what? His people. His people is Israel. Don't let the stranger feel like the Lord has cut you off from his people. Go ahead and read. Neither let the drop, neither let the unit say, Behold, I am a dry tree. That's right. You shouldn't be feeling like you can't have no part in it. If you decide to do what the Lord say right before we got down to this part, what did it say? It say, Blessed is the man that doeth this. That includes male and female. Go ahead and read. Verse 5, bro. I'm sorry, verse uh verse 4. For well, thus say the Lord unto the eunuchs uh -huh. that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me. So he's talking to the eunuchs now. Thus said the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. And what else? 
and take hold of my ple of my covenant. I'm not choosing things that please me and take hold of my covenant. What's that covenant, brothers and sisters? Those commandments. You decide to get baptized, you come up under the covenant. That's a unit, stranger, and Israel in the flesh. Because even Israel in the flesh got to become spiritually circumcised. Go ahead and read. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls uh -huh. a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. That's right, because some Israelites in the flesh, they, they ain't going to get it. They're going to kick at Jesus. And the Lord is going to allow other nations to come up and have a name better than of sons and of daughters. Go ahead and read. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. That's right, verse 6. Also, the sons of the stranger uh -huh. that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, uh -huh. to love the name of the Lord, Go ahead. to be his servants. Uh -huh. Everyone that keep the Sabbath from polluting. Everyone that keep the Sabbath. Brothers, we ain't talking about the feast days, even though you got to keep that. But this chapter is really highlighting the Lord's Sabbath day. It says, every one that uh, also the son of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants everyone that keep the Sabbath from polluting it and what else? and take hold of my covenant uh -huh, go ahead. even then will I bring to my holy mountain uh -huh. and make them joyful in my house of prayer now so we see in verse 4 he talked to the eunuchs didn't he? Yeah. he told the eunuchs if you keep my Sabbath and take hold of my covenant right? Now we're down in verse 7, he, uh, verse 8, verse 6, I'm sorry, he's talking to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be a service everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant. Same thing he told the eunuch, right? So the Lord covered all the bases. All the sons of Adam got a way to come into the Lord's Sabbath day. But you got to keep it now. Go ahead and read their burnt offerings and their sacrifice shall be accepted upon my own. That's right, go ahead. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. For just Israel? All people. For all people. Verse 8, go ahead. The Lord God which gathered the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him uh -huh. besides those that are gathered unto me. That's unto right. Him. That's right. And when the Lord gets back, he's going to gather others besides Israel. The ones that decide to keep his Sabbath and do what he say, he's going to bring them also to his holy mountain and give them a name better than a son and a daughter. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. This is the last place. One scripture here. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8. Thirty-two and verse eight. You get it, brother? Go ahead and read. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, uh -huh. when He separated the sons of Adam, when He separated the sons of Adam. Okay, go ahead. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. All right, so we're not talking about the actual, uh, you know, inhabitant or the. You know, every child that came out of Israel, we talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? So when he set the boundaries of, of the people, the son of Adam, he set them to, according to the number of the children of Israel. So from the creation of light to the end of all flesh, let's see what we got. We're going to count from here, right here, all the way to here, all right? One, all the way to seven, all right? You're not going to go like this. Like that, and then come down and count that. You're just going to keep going from one all the way over, okay? Y'all got that? Now let's go. Now, I right, can hear you. One, one two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So how much is that? Twelve. Twelve thousand years, right? Until the end of all flesh is on this earth. That is. The end of the Lord's Sabbath day. So, the title of the lesson, the Lord's Sabbath day, labor therefore to end in two. Hope somebody got some understanding. I thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.